it is good to give God the glory. It's good to confess that we need each other. It's good to confess that we are, are uh, part of something so much bigger than just ourselves. Is it not? That we are part of something bigger than just our own church. We're part of bigger than just our own denomination. We're part of God's work around the world. And there are a billion people who claim to be Christians, more than a billion people who claim to be Christians. And here we are, just this, this few of us here tonight, and yet God is with us just as he always been. He's been with every person who's worshipped today on this great Lord's Day. We are part of something so great, and it's great to give him the glory for what he has done this day and every day of our lives. And so I thank you all for your, your praises and your, your testimonies. And we'll continue to pray for each other and love each other, shall we? Let's be the church. We need each other. And um, when we think about what it means to be the church, it's truly an amazing thing to think about being built up by God as living stones. This idea of living stones that we see in 1 Peter as we continue our series in 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 10 he talks about being living stones living stones well you know I like rocks and there's nothing better than 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 nice rocks and beautiful rocks and nothing better than seeing a a, a 300 year old house built out of huge huge stones that somebody spent the time making them smooth and pure and stacking them up and 300 years later they're still standing there but the stones that God builds are eternal the living stones that he has made us into have the potential to be standing forever and ever and ever as the, the temple of God and that's a wonderful thing so we need to give him the glory for that that what we do is not so temporary even though our lives are temporary even though our time here on earth is short and even though the things that we do can can fall apart and the things we make will will rust away and all those types of things we are part of something that will never die that will never end and we're part of something that is with us today and that we will have forever and ever and I pray we'll never forget that and that we'll never praise stop praising God for the fact that we are not alone in this world that we are not left to our own devices and our own smarts which no matter how smart we are we're not too smart compared to God we need the Lord and I'm grateful for that tonight anybody else with a testimony all right we'll take out your Bibles we're at first Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 10 talking about living stones Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. As you come to Him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You may be seated. I have preached from this passage numerous times, and I believe I have preached on this passage before, but since I've been here. But first Peter has to be seen in its full context. And we can't skip anything just because we looked at it before. Well, last week we looked at chapter 1, the end of chapter 1 through the first beginnings of chapter 2, 
talking about being holy, living holy lives, and what that looks like, and what was needed for that to happen, and that God in us is what we need, that he is the one who makes us holy, that he is the one that, that gives us holiness, that holiness is not a status that we attain. Holiness is not a position that we have in the kingdom of God. Holiness is a way of life that comes through the power of the Spirit that lives within, he, within us. It is His holiness that makes us holy. It is His presence in us that makes us holy. It doesn't mean that we do not have our own holiness through Him. We can live holy lives which His holiness lived outward from us but it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit within us, through the power of Jesus Christ within us. So at the beginning of chapter 2, Peter tells us, So rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so it is, excuse me, so by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good that this holiness will, will it affect the way we live our lives. This holiness will affect the way we see the world around us, the way we, we think about other people, to, to stop our malice and, and deceit and, and the things of life that seem to be so normal in our world today, hypocrisy and envy and, and slander of every kind. And It breaks my heart to hear people on TV just calling people terrible names. It, it just breaks my heart to, to hear people just degrade everything that somebody has done their whole life that has worked for their whole life and just degraded as if it's worthless it just, just, I, it just kills me to hear people do this and this is not what holy people do we don't do this we live a life that understands that we have a God who loves each one of us and that when we are with God ourselves that's all that matters we are not to judge others we are to let God be the judge we are to love everyone. We're to pray for everyone. And so he tells us that after we rid ourselves of these things, as you come to him, the living stone, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. The fact is, when the temple was built, the stones were cut. And I shared with you before about how it was cut and what they did. But, but when they cut a stone, you, you go to the quarries around Jerusalem and you find rocks that have been cut and they've started to been hewn and they started to been smoothed out and cleaned up and squared off. And if they have a crack in them, they're just discarded because stones that were not perfect were not used in the temple. Stones that were not holy in their, in their own sense, whole, in their own sense, were not used in the temple. You find broken pieces of stone all over the quarries. You see rocks with, with just cracks in them that, that have not been used. That, that could have had the cracks on the inside. Nobody could see it. You know, that's things we do. You know, you, you, if something cracks on one side, you turn it around type of thing. But the fact is that, that those stones were not used. And these stones were living stones. I shared with you before that the, the, the limestone cliff that was outside of Jerusalem that was shaved down to, to build the temple was a special kind of limestone. When it was cut, it was very soft. It was alive. It was moist. And when they cut it, it could be rougher on, on top and bottom. They would smooth off the front. It was easy to smooth off and smooth off the back, but the top and the bottom were left rough. Left all the, the, the gyps, you know, the, the stuff hanging off the bottom of it and the top of it. And they would take it and they would lay it on the foundation line. And they would take that stone and they would rub it back and forth. And these stones are humongous. Some of them are 10 feet long, 4 feet tall. They're just humongous stones. And they would rub it back and forth and rub off those rough edges until they laid flat on each other. And that dust of the stone would become the mortar inside of it. It would get wet and become the, the glue that holds it together. And many of these stones are still standing today, 2,000 years later. But when Peter talks about being living stones and having the living stone, and we being living stones, that he is our foundation, he is our cornerstone. He calls us to let Jesus be the one that which we rub up against. That he is the, the, the measure by which we should live, the measure by which the world should be able to see us. That as long as we stick around Jesus and we rub up against him and, and rub up against his people, the rough edges will be rubbed off and we could become the perfect stones to build up the kingdom of God, build up the temple of the Lord. This is what he calls us to do. That's what he calls us to do. That's what he wants for us. 
You, like living stones, are being built in a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to worship God in pure hearts and give Him the glory that He deserves, just like the priests did. You know, in the ancient world, when in, in the Jerusalem temple, only one, one person, the high priest, was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once a year to be in the presence of God. And only the priests themselves were the ones who could offer the sacrifices. And they had to, we bring our sacrifices to them if we were there, and we bring them to them, and they would take them, and they would offer the sacrifices because we couldn't get close enough. We weren't allowed to get that close to God. But through Jesus Christ, when he split the veil and the temple was spread wide open and everybody could get into the Holy of Holies, we all now can be priests. And we all can come to God ourselves. And the writer to Hebrews tells us, and we can approach the throne of, throne of grace with confidence. With confidence. We can go to the mercy seat with confidence. Why? Because our cornerstone invites us to come close and to have the rough edges worn off and to be shaped and molded by his hands and placed in our place within the temple of the Lord. This temple is not a stagnant temple. It is a living temple. We are the temple of God everywhere that we go. We are the temple of God everywhere that we, we, we eat, every place that we sleep, every place that we, we shop for groceries, every place we, we work, all these places. We are the temple of God in those places. Paul tells us in, in, in several places about how we are, are, are vessels of God, that we are, are, are earthen vessels, and we have the treasure of the Holy Spirit within us, and we take it wherever we go, and with this, we are the church. We are the church. A holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. This is who we're called to be. And God does this for us. God does this for us. And so the words that we say, the, 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 the spirit that we have, the, the way we treat other people, all, the things, all of these things are spiritual sacrifices. Paul writes in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 1, we should live our lives as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to Him. These living sacrifices come in these earthen vessels. And they need to be shaped. And the fact is, as I shared before, you know, talk about this morning about the love coming in and flowing out of us is the way it should be. Well, I'm a cracked pot. I leak. And I'm glad I leak. God pours his love and his grace into me and, and it just kind of just goes out. And I'm not bragging about that, but I'm a cracked pot. And we all need to be cracked pots in the temple of God. We need to let his grace flow through us and out of us. And as we, we, we live our lives, his grace just is part of everything that we do. And the way we treat people is without malice and slander. We treat each other with, with grace, including those who, who, who know nothing about Jesus Christ. Those that we see in the grocery store and the places that we go. Those that we, we just really just wonder about these people. But God wants us to share this grace with him because we are the temple of the Lord. He says, I say, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. You know, it, it's, it seems like in our country that it's, weak, you know, that, that it's, it's less and less cool to be a Christian, if you know what I mean. That we're pretty much in many corners being told to just shut our mouths. Just stay out of the way. Keep your faith to yourself. It's personal and you just keep it to yourself and you just leave us alone. Don't tell us what to do and don't tell us that we're wrong. And this is the world we live in. But when we trust Him and we live our lives and we let His grace flow out of us and we just be the people of God. You know, I realized some years ago, actually, I realized that the days of being able to go and stand on a street corner and shout out the, the gospel of Jesus Christ are probably over right now. Doesn't mean they always will be. But right now, the way we used to do things, being able to knock on doors, you, uh, I'm, I don't like knocking on doors because you never know what I'm going to find at the other end, pointing out the door. It's a different world. And the way of reaching people today 
has got to change. And the fact is, as we look at the world that has changed in this postmodern world that we live in and, and the way people see life and, and how nothing is, 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 is permanent and there's, there's no sense of, of truth that is, that is absolute and there's no sense of uh, everything is relative and, and what is right for me is right for me and what's right for you is right for you and, and don't tell me that I'm wrong and I won't tell you that you're wrong but if you tell me that I'm wrong I'm going to tell you that you're wrong about that. And we have this constant bickering back and forth about, you know, what, what is right and what is wrong and what isn't right and what isn't wrong and all these types of things. And, and, and so dealing with these things, you know, in, in, in the, when I was a kid, back in the modern world, everybody wanted proof. Give me proof. I got to see evidence. Prove it to me. And you could argue with somebody, you could debate with somebody, and they might actually come to where they believe what you say. Because if you could give enough evidence... They would believe you. Not anymore. Not anymore. So as living stones, we need to believe and hold on to the fact that the provenient grace of God still exists. That the Holy Spirit is still moving in this world. That God is still wooing the lost to himself. And he uses us in much different ways than he used to. He uses us to simply love them and walk beside them and show them the truth. And when they're ready to listen to it, tell them the truth but in a way that is not confrontive. And it's not, it's, not like, it's not like we could say to somebody, you know, you've got to stop this. But they people say, well, you know what? Who are you to tell me what I need to stop? We've got to show them with our lives that life can be different, that it should be different. We have to show them by the grace of God as it flows out of us as living stones that, that we will not be moved. They will not intimidate us. They will not tell us that we can't love them. One of my favorite things to say to somebody that seems to be so hard, I tell them, you know, I'm going to love you whether you like it or not. That's what we're called to do. To live this life as living sacrifices. To live this life as living stones. Live our, this life in the temple of God that he is building all over the world as, as examples, as testimonies of ourselves. And we will not be put to shame. We will not be put to shame. If we live the truth and we share the truth with love and tenderness and kindness and we embrace the opportunities that God gives us to be the help that someone needs, to be the encouragement that they need, to be somebody who cares in a world that rarely cares about anything, we will not be shamed by what we do. But to us who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the, the stone the builders believe, or the, the builders rejected, it becomes the cornerstone or the capstone. The capstone, if you know Greek architecture and actually Roman architecture, which is what the new temple was built from, that you know they have these arches, lots of arches. And you wonder how in the world they got that arch to stay up there. They're just rocks and they're just laying it. They don't have any rods to them or anything else. They're just up there by their own weight. And the capstone is the very top stone they put into the arch that holds up the entire roof. The capstone has wedges in it that everything else is lined up against it. And when it's lined up against it, all the weight moves to the center and all the weight is on the capstone. It holds all the weight for the entire roof. And these ancient buildings are 2,000 years old and they're still standing there in earthquake land and everything else because the capstone has been solid. But those who do not believe in, in God and don't believe in Jesus Christ, they don't want a capstone. They don't want to be told where they should stay. They don't, need to be, they don't want to be part of something that, that holds them close and tight. The capstone for us is the very essence of, of, of what we need. When we feel the pressure on our, our lives, we feel our hearts are burdened, and we feel like, like the world is, is too much for us, and we can't, we can't just go on. It's hard to get out of bed in the morning. It's just so overwhelming. And we're leaning on that capstone, and the pressure goes on the capstone, and it will not fail. When the world shakes around us and when the, when the, when the earthquake of life comes and we are, we are in where we're supposed to be amongst the living stones and that capstone is in place, 
we will not fall as long as we stay and continue to live as living stones for Jesus takes that weight and that pressure he takes all the the, the shock of the earthquake of life around us he is our capstone but this stone also causes people to stumble on a rock that makes them fall when we live our lives as Jesus Christ would have us live and as we live our lives around us people will have trouble with us people will have trouble with us because we're different and the fact is it's good for us to be different because even though we love them with all of our hearts and we're going to love them whether they like it or not we're still they're still going to feel guilty whenever they're around us we don't have to say a word in fact we probably shouldn't say a word they already know and they know the difference and it causes them to stumble and if they're stumbling it means they fall on their knees that's a good thing that's a good thing so simply live our lives as stones and the stone that that has given us life is a stumbling stone for those who who need to fall have you ever seen somebody walk around so proud their nose up in the air that they don't look down at the ground they trip over something you ever see anybody like that they're so fall flat on their face sometimes we need to be tripped up the simple truth what Isaiah said about Jesus Christ he grew up like a tender root out of dry ground something you don't even notice until you stumble over it to your trip as you walk this world they stumble because they disobey the message which is also what they were destined to do if you obey if you disobey the message if you live your life on your own you are going to stumble and you're going to fall there's no one who can live in their own life and they can have billions of dollars and they can have every power in the world they can have everything in their life and they will not be happy apart from Jesus Christ they may enjoy all their stuff but in their hearts they will never know true happiness because it can only come from God but you you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light that's who you are put a smile on your face that's a good thing this is who you are let me read that again very close slowly you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light that's who you are as living stones we are these things we are God's chosen people Paul states several times that the church is the new Israel we are the chosen people of God we are the ones that he has blessed with his presence we are the ones he has given privilege to to be called the children of God because that's what we are that's who we are we're adopted into God's God's son and daughtership we're we're adopted into the family of God and we are priests we can pray for one another we can pray for each other we can pray to God directly we can approach the throne of grace with confidence we can go beside the hospital bed it doesn't have to be a pastor you can go beside the hospital bed and you can hold someone's hand and you can pray for them and God will do amazing things we're a body of believers and a, 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 a family of a priest or their Lord is doing so much for us we're God's special possession you are God's special possession you know I, I, you think about that like me me God's special possession you know I'm I'm getting infirm the old knees are hurting my hips are hurting my back's hurting my my eyes are hurting and people look at me and their eyes hurt we're getting infirm I'm a special possession God doesn't look at the outside he looks at the inside 
He looks at us and, and sees us and our changed heart and our love for Him and our desire to be the people He wants us to be. And He looks at us and we are His special possession. He loves us. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be, be filled with joy and not be burdened by the problems of this world. He wants us to, to, to realize that, that He is greater than the problems we see in our country today. That He is the answer to the problems in our country today. That we don't have to spend all day doing this, wondering, oh, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. We can live with the confidence that God is God, and we are not. And He loves us anyway, and He's ours, and we are His special possessions. That's the freedom He gives us as living stones. Freedom to be everything he's created us to be without fear, without worry, without concerns about whether, whether the stock market's going to collapse or whether this is going to happen or not. Our hope is in him. Amen? Our hope is in God. If it's not, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. If our hope is in our stuff, our hope is in our politics, our hope is in our, 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 the people around us, if our hope is in getting enough people to sign a petition, if our hope is all these things, then our hope is in the wrong place. Now all those things are important. And we need to be aware, we need to pray, and we need to act where we need to act, absolutely. But our hope cannot be in these things. Our hope has to be in God. And do we truly believe that His Holy Spirit still moves? Do we truly believe in our hearts that He has an answer and that He is working His will, that He is with the vilest of people, even the vilest of politicians, and He's there wooing them, trying to get into them, trying to reach them, trying to touch them? Here's the gist of it all. Once you were not a people. But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy. But now you have received mercy. These words come from Hosea. Remember Hosea had some sons. One was called not loved the other one was no mercy another one was not my people and he said to them and they said to them your sons represent Israel then when they are away from me when they're doing their own thing when they don't trust me they're not my people there'll be no mercy But once, he tells him, once you were not my people, but now you are my people. Once you had no mercy, and now you have mercy. God says the same thing to us these 2,700 years after Hosea. That where we are in our world, and the world that is around us, and the, the essence of of everything that seems to be falling apart before our eyes. We are still the people of God. And we still have His mercy. And his mercy is not a pity. His mercy is His love. For the Hebrew that's in Hosea is that chesed love I've mentioned several times. This loving mercy of God. The tender loving mercies of God that you see throughout the Old Testament when you read those words. 
tender mercies or mercy or, or, or tender loving mercy or, or whatever those, type, those words are translated. It's the chesed love of God that will not give up on us. He will not give up on us. He will not give up on this country. He will not give up on this church. He will not give up on his people. He will not give up because he is God. And we are his. I pray that encourages you. That he looks at us as his special, special possession. Precious children of God. He looks at us as the very embodiment of his temple. He has no hard temple anymore. He has no stone temple in Jerusalem. He has no place where his spirit dwells. Where does his spirit dwell? Dwell in this temple right here. Right in here. And we are his temple. And we are living stones in his temple. And we can be victorious in this world around us. And that's what he wants for us. So I pray that as we think about our lives and the things that we need to do, and, and again, as we think about this mess that we see around us, that we will understand who we really are in him and who he is for us and who he wants to be for our entire nation and for this world. And he is not going to give up on anybody in this world. He is going to woo them until their last breath. He's going to love them until their last breath. He's going to, to, to crave for them to accept his love and to accept him as their, sa their savior. He's going to love every person that we see every day is loved by God and valued by God and want to be known. They want to be known by God. They just don't know it. They just don't know it. They're craving for something and we have what they want. They just don't know it. So let us be a priesthood. Let us be the church. Let us be the people of God. And let us live our lives as living stones for Him. We'll close our service tonight by singing how deep the Father's love for us. A love that will not let us go. A love that should compel us to love others. A love that moves in our hearts and helps us to live the way we're supposed to live. A spiritual house of holy priesthoods, of, of, uh, be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices. These sacrifices are not the lambs, they're ourselves as we live for others.